I'm Zehra Taşkın and I'm working as a visiting professor at Adam Mitchell University Scholarly Communication Research Group. Uh, I'll be here for two years to conduct my project entitled Creating Content-Based Citation Analysis System for English and for Polish. And my project is funded by uh, Polish National Agency for Scientific Exchange. Uh, I'm also the assistant professor of Hacettepe University Department of Information Management in Turkey. Uh, unfortunately, we can we couldn't organize our meeting, um, our lecture uh, in on time because of the uh, restrictions in Poland for coronavirus cases. So we decided to record a video for my lecture on content-based citation analysis. I hope you like this. Uh, but before my presentation, I would like to say something about my research field. Uh, I'm working on enhancing research and research evaluations like all the members, all the other members of Scholarly Communication Research Group. There are too many aspects of research evaluations, uh, such as publication analysis, metrics, indicators, ethical and theoretical uh, issues of uh, the process and there are too many aspects in it and my field of work is especially on citation analysis and today my talk is on next generation citation analysis i will explain what the citations are and what are they used for uh, during this presentation and i also give some tips about um, applying for a grant uh, as a PhD student or as a postdoctoral scholar and also maybe we can uh, talk, not we, we can talk, I can uh, show you some collaboration opportunities with you and me during, a, the, during my project. So if you have any question regarding to my presentation or other kind of things you wondered, you can send me an email or you can write me from Twitter, anywhere you want. Okay, let's begin. I have some assistants with me today. Uh, I would like to introduce you my assistants. Uh, they are here to show you the importance of research evaluation and they are here to prove you research evaluation is not easy as you think about think it um, here is the actor the most famous actor of research evaluation process he is the decision maker all important decisions such as tenures and incentives of, for researchers are made by him he decides uh, which he decide which project is supported he decides who will get the tenure he decides uh, how many incentives will be given to scholars and he is responsible of these kind of tasks he also a, he is also a researcher uh, in the at university but he is really good track record of publications and he is really good at his field so he has a role in the academia as a decision maker um, all the others other scholars need to become measurable for his evaluation processes they have to create a portfolio about their research activities and present them to him uh, and wait for his decision but how he does this because he is also a researcher and they are the same not, not the same level but they are in the same academia but how he can do this does he have a magical power to evaluate researchers around him no he just has the list of rules for research evaluation processes and uses these rules to decide who is the best then the decisions are made then he makes his duty as a decision maker but is it that much easy 
let's look at this. And please look at the researchers. Um, they are the researchers. And I will explain you their fields and their uh, profiles later on. But uh, when you first look at them, uh, you can see that some of them are happy, some of them are angry, some of them are super ambitious, some of them are worried, some of them don't have any feeling about the uh, evaluation processes, the, uh, they don't have any feeling on, feelings on their faces. Uh, their feelings are different, but their aim is the same. They want to get a tenure for their future in the academia. Uh, they have to collect their scientific output into, or into a portfolio and send it to the decision maker and wait for his uh, decision. They seem almost the same, although they have different feelings, their appearances are the same. Their weights and heights are the same, although they have different feelings, uh, their genders are the same. <clears throat> because they don't have enough women competitors in their uh, fields because women gave up working for tenure in the academia for some reasons maybe we can discuss it in a different seminar because this subject is complicated but their genders are the same they, they are almost the same so it seems that the duty of decision maker is easy is it find a man Find the man that has more track record of publications and citations and look at the portfolio that is, seems great and give tenure to him. Is it that easy? Same question is also valid in here. And we have to look them in detail. Let's look them. Uh, these two are working together. They have to work together because their working field requires collaborative work, but they have diff also different aims in their field, like they are good friends and they, cite, they generally prefer to cite each other to make their art scientific output cited. And they decided also they decided not to cite their competitors. Uh, because they want to block, block uh, the other competitors and they are fighting them. They, they, they are uh, fighting to block the other competitors of them. Uh, because they know citations are important part of research evaluation and they know the effects of it. So they are trying to do their best by creating their own citation gang. And please look at this lonely boy here. He is working for sports sciences and uh, he is working on uh, social aspects of sports sciences. Maybe, yes. And his main duty <coughs> is teaching in his university. And he really he has really heavy working load, teaching load in his university, but he has to publish papers to get tenure. Uh, so he is going to publish uh, low quality papers in low quality journals because he has to do it and he knows the uh, ways to publish papers in an easy way. Here is the luckiest man in our environment. He is a medical doctor. He has to conduct surgeries every day. He reports all surgeries uh, he made because they are the evidences of medical activity and they have to be reported. So it means he has good track record of citations, the good track record of publications and so on. He is the luckiest man in our uh, environment and this is a physician he has to work in the lab to conduct his experiments uh, his lab um, hardware is really expensive 
and he has to conduct project to buy them and uh, he can never work alone because all the experiments need big lab opportunities but he has <coughs> good track record of publications because uh, there are too many journals in his field but uh, his main disadvantage is the average number of authors of his papers are 30. He has to share the points, the tenure points, with all these 30 people. So he, he has disadvantages, but he can publish papers on his field because he is, <coughs> because he is a, a good researcher in physics. And here is the philosopher. A uh, decision maker wants him to publish articles. And he is a philosopher and he is one of you. And decision maker wants him to publish articles, but there is no enough journals to publish. He tends to publish books on his subject because um, in his field, uh, books are more important than articles. Uh, but he needs at least two years to write a good book. Uh, so the other uh, colleagues of him are the same. So he doesn't have enough citation potential in his field also. So. He is the other lonely boy in our environment, but he also has different disadvantages in this world. And let's look at this guy here. This is an engineer. He has to work with others because his field is also interdisciplinary like the others. He has to find collaborators to be able to conduct new, new projects, but he is young and inexperienced. No one wants to work with him because his portfolio is not enough to work with him. So he is not in a good place in his um, scientific environment. And please look at the man in the middle. Who is he? Is he a Batman or Darth Vader or Samurai? But he is the owner of cumulative advantage. And what is the cumulative advantage? Um, he wrote a paper with one of the science elites. And science elite is the prominent author in a, speci in a specific field. And he gets citations every day. Other scholars want to work with him because he is visible. Uh, his project proposals are accepted by funders easily because he has a good name in his field. So uh, he is really, really good place in this network. But can we say that all these scholars are the same anymore? And please look at the real examples not the legos. Uh, look at the slide. These are real scientists and artists. Stephen Hawking, Marie Curie, Ada Lovis, Chopin, Copernic, Rosalind Franklin, Tesla, Adam Mickiewicz. We know them from their contributions to science and arts. We don't need to measure them. But if you have to measure in which metric you would focus on? I mean, are there any tools that make you able to select the best across them? Uh, here is the question. Can we evaluate them as equals? Not all the subjects are equal. They are working in different fields. They are working for a different uh, fields. They, are, they were worked in different periods of time. Um, my field is totally interested in this inequality and we are, we are trying to prove the um, drawbacks of 
this inequality and we are trying to fix uh, the problems depend on uh, this inequality and I specifically focus on citations as you realize there are too many aspects of research evaluation and I'm trying to enlighten the citation part of it and my main hypothesis is all citations are not equal you cannot count them because apples and they are apples and oranges. Uh, if someone cite me without reading my paper, it is meaningless. But if someone use the um, measure that developed by me, it is really important citation. But we cannot count them as the same. And my main point is to prove the differences of citations and I'm trying to do this. Uh, I finished my, dessert, uh, my PhD on this subject and I'm uh, trying to go further uh, for this subject. But I think at first we need to understand what the citations are and uh, what are they used for. Uh, I like the definition of Cronin. He said that citations are frozen footprints in academic achievements and one can easily follow the way of the previous scholar with the help of these footprints. As PhD students, you know that you have to uh, search for literature and you have to cite them. Why? Because they are the ancestors of your idea or they are the ancestors of your field so you have to cite them because science is cumulative and science is cumulative be, be to thanks to the uh, citations but uh, in 1960 a really important uh, thing happened in the world web of science you may know uh, it as citation index was founded by Eugene Garfield. It is really good uh, innovation for academia because it um, indexed scientific outputs to provide effective information retrieval system for scholars and to provide a collection management tool, really good collection management tool for librarians. And uh, many professionals use it as a tool for information retrieval but decision makers realize that uh, citation indexes provide really good numbers for decision makers for example if you want to know that how big is your university you, the indexes can provide you the numbers about your university, the number of publications, the number of citations, age index, impact factor of journals that you published in. They are all numbers. They can reach numbers of your university and it is possible to rank your university. It is possible to see the place of your university among uh, the world, all around the world. It is possible. So uh, these citation and other uh, citation uh, indexes uh, present this opportunity to the decision makers. Although the owner of uh, citation indexes said that citation frequency was a measure of the extent of a research activity rather than the significance of an author's work. In this way, decision makers, decision makers still use these numbers to evaluate research and researchers uh, and universities and countries. We are trying to select the universities. Uh, we, we, we use these numbers to choose our universities. Uh, students use this and also uh, lecturers use these rankings to choose their next steps 
and all this academia use these indexes but in today we are facing with the uh, publication explosion uh, publish or perish word scholars try to publish papers uh, without concerning their uh, qualities or without concerning the contributions to the science so uh, it creates different practices like manipulations citation gangs citation games and tendency to cite colleagues not competitors there are too many different kinds of manipulations we can find in the academia thanks to the uh, number of session in the academia uh, i want to show you this this is the uh, print screen of web of science and this is my profile in web of science you can see my pub number of publications of mine um, there is there are 22 publications of mine are indexed in web of science but they are not all of them are articles there are um, editorial materials letters and different types of materials in there my age index is 4 and my number of citations i gather is 70 the number of citations is 6 does it sound for you is it meaningful or does it sense anything because uh, it is nothing alone if you evaluate me by using these numbers you cannot achieve anything because you don't know the publication patterns of my field you don't know uh, how the academia work uh, works in my field my country uh, you don't know the early career researchers um, problems confusions they mm, so challenges so it, the, these numbers indicate not indicate nothing for you because you have to know further to understand my production you never saw saw any of my publication so is it possible to evaluate me only looking at numbers you have to open my paper you have to read this to to understand um, my um, contributions to science so uh, citation indexes present these numbers but decision makers have to be careful by using this number when they use these numbers and there are also other problems and facts in the academia maybe we can mention it, mention them uh, in the academia there is really um, uh, old study uh, it is from 2006 and it reveals that uh, only 20% of authors 20% of authors do not see the original articles this is old article maybe we can uh, check it uh, in today maybe this number is so higher than uh, than this time that time but if the citers don't read your study and cite is it meaningful and how you can you understand whether they read this or not it is a bit complicated uh, there is a really good ex um, example in the literature it is Madeira example uh, you can find the uh, information about the paper in the uh, footnote um, there is a paper in non-english language paper uh, published in uh, a journal and an english language paper is cited this one uh, by translating it but there is a translation mistake on the paper but all the others don't see the original article uh, and cite 
the translation, the wrong uh, translation. So the uh, papers on Madeira and Madeira insects uh, are problematic and all the literature about these insects uh, are complicated. It is really problematic thing for scientific fields. You can spread the wrong information uh, like Madeira example by uh, not reading the papers that you cite. This is one of the big problems in the academia. And this is not problem, Matthew effect. This is not a big problem. This is problem. This is a problem for early career researchers. This is an advantage for um, old, all these good term, I think, old academics, old scholars in the academia. Because Matthew effect depends on the sentence. Whoever has it will be given more, whoever has it will be taken away. If you have one citations to your study, you will get more citations. And if you don't have any, it is possible not to get any citations uh, whole your life, in whole your uh, scientific life. Um, I'm not the only person that um, realized these uh, problems. These problems are argued in the literature, so in so many papers. And in today, uh, people trying to understand, trying to develop new systems to understand syntactic and semantic approaches of citations. And they call uh, this approach as content-based citation analysis studies. Uh, the main aim of content-based citation analysis studies are focusing on um, the meaning of citation, the main aim of citation, not the number of citation, and going uh, further from the uh, number of citations. It is totally about this. Um, in 2015, when I first began my PhD dissertation, uh, one of my dream was uh, creating a new citation classification system that can replace traditional citation counting. And I began my PhD dissertation with this idea and uh, I aimed to achieve this um, this aim to this classification system uh, for Turkish language. But if you conduct the study uh, on text classification methods or computing methods, you you need to have grants because. Uh, you have to hire experts, you have to uh, buy uh, software and hardware, so you need grant money. Then I applied, I and my advisor applied for uh, grants uh, for my PhD dissertation, uh, and we get this money uh, from the Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey. And it is really good money in Turkey to hire uh, experts, to hire technical staff, and to, hi uh, to buy some uh, software and hardware for uh, conducting the project. And I want to show you the uh, timeline, or not timeline, the uh, flow of my uh, processes for content-based citation analysis. Uh, first of all, I had to decide uh, the data set. Uh, if you conduct a content-based citation analysis study, you, it is better to choose a specific area for because you can evaluate a specific area uh, easily uh, and it is really, it can, uh, show really good 
results. So I choose you know, library and information science field in Turkey and I um, collect data about 430 uh, publications. Then we create a database and the user interfaces for uh, data collection. Uh, we gather, uh, gathered all the metadata and references and full texts of, uh, of the articles. Metadata is the information about title, abstract, uh, author name, affiliations, uh, keywords, and these kind of um, uh, descriptive uh, information about the paper. And references are the citations of this paper, and also we need full text to classify citation sentences. Uh, then I uh, created a taxonomy for citation classes. I will show you the taxonomy of my project later on. And the next process is tagging citation sentences. In this phase, I need inter annotator agreement. I need expert taggers and expert taggers read, uh, read all the sentences and tag them uh, to citation classes. Uh, I will show you the example uh, in the following slide. After the tagging process, the uh, processing methods and algorithms we, uh, we implied and then we create a model for content-based citation analysis studies. Uh, here is the interface for article data. Uh, there are two different journals in library information science and you can uh, collect the metadata information in this field and you can save this. And the second part is for references. All the references are listed here. This is Turkish version of this, but we are trying to create a new system for uh, English and Polish languages. These are the full texts of the documents. This is the basic interface for article data. Uh, this is the uh, citation taxonomy of mine. Uh, I uh, designed it by using literature studies and also uh, by looking at the citations uh, in the literature. And uh, I created four different classification classes for citations. Um, in the first group, it is meaning group. There is positive, negative, and neutral citations in it. If the author has positive feelings about a paper that cited, that is uh, that he or she cited, and we can tag it as positive citation, and it is the same for negatives. And for the purpose citations, uh, it is a bit different. Um, we are trying to understand the main uh, aim of the author uh, when they cite the other studies. For example, um, did she or he use someone's definition in uh, his or her study? Or he or she used someone's methods in his or her study. Uh, and there are different types of subtypes of uh, citations in the purpose part. And for the shape part, it is a bit different from the others. Uh, you can realize that there is different shapes of citations. In some citations, uh, authors generally choose this way. Um, in the world, there are too many studies conducted on this subject and open a parenthesis and cite at least 20 papers in one parenthesis. This is the multiple citations in one sentence uh, class. And in some citations, 
authors uh, say the name of the author when they cite. For example, according to Tashkan study, blah, blah, blah. So there are different types of uh, citations in this class. And for the last class is array class. Um, we are looking at uh, section of citation. It means if you cite a paper in findings part, it is more valuable than introduction or literature or number of users in the text, number of citations in different sections, etc. This is the main citation classes of my study. And then this is the tagging interface. Uh, it is password protected area and the tagger has, ha, has to choose the articles and the full text of articles listed. We change this uh, interface and it is now more easy to select citation sentences for now. And um, Tagger found the citation sentence and found the references related to this citation sentence. A citation sentence can include uh, uh, two or more sentences. It is not necessary to uh, be a one sentence. And one can easily tag citations as for the different citation classes. This is the basic interface of my PhD dissertation. It is not in this uh, shape for now, but it is more easier than uh, previous. Uh, after tagging process, uh, I use Veka, University of Waikato's uh, software to, for analysis, and uh, I use Ngram method for word preprocessing and apply the algorithm and present the classification performance in my study. Here is the success rate. I don't want to talk too much about it because uh, it is also published in English language, but I can say that I'm not satisfied with the meaning part because in Turkish library information science literature, the number of positive and negative citations are really rare. And so the success of classification is low also because it is also hard to understand the meaning of citations for taggers because um, the authors, the citers can say uh, this when they cite. For example, um, this paper is good in some, uh, for, uh, this paper is good, but it would be better to use this technique. Is it negative or positive? We don't know the main feeling, but in my study, I consider this as negative because the second part is the real feeling. But I think, I, now I, told, I think in a different way, I, and I change the classification of my study after this concerns. But the purpose and shape, um, but the classification success for purpose and shape uh, parts are really good, uh, better than meaning part, and classification performance is uh, good for purpose and shape parts. Uh, we didn't use any algorithms for array part because it can be calculated, it could be calculated by using um, numbers only. We don't have, need any algorithms for it. Uh, you can see, uh, maybe every, everyone can uh, know the IMRAT structure, Introduction, Methodology, Research and Discussion. Uh, it is possible to say that uh, most of the scholars uh, cite, uh, post, most of the positive and negative citations are placed in research and discussion parts. It is important because when they compare something, with their, when they compare some papers with 
their uh, papers, they generally use positive and negative impressions. So it is uh, quite um, obvious that people, uh, when people uh, cite someone's study uh, and compare the studies each other, they can cite in a positive or negative way. Uh, and you can uh, check the other kinds of other types of citations in this uh, slide. I don't want to say more things about my PhD. I finished my PhD in 2017, and, uh, but I I felt that it, my study is, was not finished because uh, I have to do this for English and Polish language. Uh, my idea is for it was for English, but after I saw this tweet from Emanuel Kuczynski, I decided to use, uh, I decided to analyze also Polish because it is a really it was a really good opportunity from Polish National Agency for Scientific Exchange. And I um, contacted with Emanuel Kulczyski and I wrote a project proposal in uh, 2019. And my project proposal was accepted by the committee. So I joined the research group, scholarly communication research group, then I'm one of the member of this team. Uh, I began working for scholarly communication research group from November and the first thing we made is uh, making a seminar for my project and we made some brainstorming on my subject and uh, one of the idea is the uh, danger of using negative or positive terms in the classification. And this is totally correct. When you use negative word in your classification, decision maker can feel that this color is not good. But who will decide if the paper, it, negative citation does not mean this paper is bad. This is the impression of citer about this study. So if you name the citation as negative, it might be harmful for some scholars. So we decide to change the classification for meaning class and uh, we decide to combine these two uh, classes into one. I didn't decide the name of the new class yet, but I think it might be um, emotional citations or something. If you have any idea about it, please write me and maybe you can name uh, one of the classes of my classification system. And this is the project timeline of mine. Uh, this year I had to create data sets. I'm trying to do this now at the house. Uh, and also I'm trying to create database and design interfaces for data gathering and tagging processes. I had to form tagging teams for English and Polish languages. I all, I've already created the team for English, but uh, I need some help for Polish language um, tagging processes. This year, uh, I decided the data set and I'm, I'm on my way to collect the data about these data sets. And I'm trying to create database and the interfaces uh, for data collection processes and um, after all these processes we will be able to collect metadata and full text of articles. But next year I will need 
a tagging process. I need help for Polish language tagging processes. And I need experts for this work. Uh, it is not a voluntary work. Uh, I will pay for the tagging processes. And if you are interested as a student of Adam Mickiewicz University, please send me an email. It is my email address. And we can contact and we can talk about the processes. And this is my project. If you have any questions about my project uh, or uh, my previous works or uh, Polish National Agency of for scientific exchanges, uh, funding programs, uh, or the processes of prog its pro programs, please write me, and I'm I will I will try to answer all of your questions. It is the end of my pre presentation. Uh, I wish uh, to I wish uh, stay safe for all of you. Thank you for listening.